You've probably heard about negative gearing, especially if you're looking up ways that you can save tax because it is incredibly commonly floated. But today I'm gonna to answer the question, is negative gearing actually a good thing? Hello everyone, my name is Ethan Ruschok, and as I said in that intro, I'm gonna be discussing negative gearing. So I'm talking about property investment, rental properties, and when they're negatively geared, what that actually means, how it affects you tax-wise, the pros and cons, and is it actually a good thing? So only people are out there looking at ways to save tax, and negative gearing is one that always gets thrown up. And it's pushed quite heavily by a lot of accountants, mortgage brokers, property developers. There's a lot of people that push negative gearing because a lot of people make money off people going into property investing. So you wanna get that impartial view to go, well, is it actually a good thing or are these people just trying to sell me a property? Are they trying to sign me up to a loan? Are they trying to sign me up to a tax package? Is there other interest at heart? And is it actually gonna be good for you? I'll jump right into how does negative gearing actually work? What is it? So negative gearing is pretty much when a investment property, a rental property that you own is in a loss position. So it's making a loss from a tax point of view and therefore that loss is offset against your other income, whether that's work income or employment income and therefore reduces your tax liability and normally will result in a refund. Now there's obviously more to it than that, but that's the basics of it. It's a rental property that's making a loss that's reducing the amount of tax you owe. So that's why negative gearing ends up being really popular because people go, oh wow, I saved myself some tax. I potentially got a good refund because they might have a significantly negatively geared property. And therefore they get a bit blind and forget to look at the overall return of that asset. So anytime you make an investment, you want to make a gain when you eventually sell that investment versus what you put in. And then obviously you're going to factor in the returns you've got along the way but you want that to be positive overall. One of the things about negative gearing is quite often that loss from a tax point of view might not be a cash loss. And what I mean by this is that quite typically negatively geared properties have a depreciation report done on them. So you're claiming depreciations for the fixtures and fittings and potentially the building, and that's going to increase that loss from a tax point of view, but not physically have cash coming out of your pocket. So you might come out square from a cash point of view, but make this large tax loss and therefore that tax refund puts you in a positive cash flow point of view. And so just to quickly wrap things up on what negative gearing is, the main reason people want a negatively geared property is to save tax. There might be a few other reasons in some situations, but that's normally the only reason why you would logically have a negative geared property if you thought the tax benefits would then help increase the overall return of that investment. So the pros of negative gearing, as I said, is mainly centered around tax. Now, obviously that means the higher the tax bracket, the greater the benefits are to you. So I'll bring this up here, and as you can see, is as your tax bracket increases, the impact of a negatively geared property increases. So the tax return or the tax reduction that you're gonna get is obviously larger depending on the size of the loss, but also the tax bracket you fall in. Like I said before, is that people are also then trying to utilize book losses. So from a tax point of view, they're utilizing the depreciation, et cetera, that's not physically costing them cash, to increase that loss and therefore their cash position stays similar, that loss increases and therefore the tax refund increases that cash position. For this strategy to work long term, you're wanting capital growth in the property. If you're not getting capital growth and you're just losing money each year on it, it's very unlikely that you're ever gonna make a profit. But you're hoping for large capital increase in this situation and investing in property is quite leveraged because typically you put down a small deposit, you take a loan out for the rest and that property value increases. That leverage is more risky, but therefore the capital returns can be large. That leads me quite well into the cons because my first con is that property investing is quite risky. It is leverage. So therefore what you've put down, that loan can increase that leverage that you've got there. But that also means that if the property values go down in price, that's gonna impact you more than say if you invested in a non-leveraged asset such as normally shares. The other main con to negatively geared property is you are then reliant on capital growth. So when you, if you invest in a property and it's not going anywhere, it's just staying steady, then that negatively gearing is gonna likely put you in an overall loss position. But if you're investing in an area, a suburb, a town that is increasing in capital value, then that's where your overall returns are likely gonna lie. But that's obviously risky because it's a lot easier to predict the cash flow from a rental point of view of rent in versus expenses and see where that's gonna end up versus trying to predict where the capital growth could end up. 
The last area I want to talk about within the cons, but it's not necessarily an exact con, but it's just something people don't talk about, especially accountants, is that when you're claiming that depreciation along the way, the capital works, that is going to reduce your cost base when it comes to capital gains purposes. So what's going to happen is then when you sell the property, if you've paid, say, $400,000 for that property, but you've claimed $100,000 of depreciation off that over the years, suddenly that cost base is going to be dropped down to $300,000. And if you go and sell that for a million dollars, you've now got a $700,000 gain instead of what some people think is only going to be $600,000. Now, while that part does sound really negative, the good thing, if you have held for over 12 months, you're going to get that 50% capital gains discount on that. So in essence, you've claimed $100,000 of depreciation along the way, but you're really going to only pay tax on $50,000 of that back the other way. But it's just a side effect of claiming depreciation that a lot of accountants or the depreciation report companies don't explain to their customers. The last area I do want to talk about is whose name is it better to be in? How does that work when it comes to tax wise? Because quite often properties are owned by husband and wife, for instance, and they own the property 50-50 or they're considering buying it in one name and they're wanting to know, well, how does that work tax wise? So I'll bring up a little bit of an example here. So say we've got a husband and wife and we've got one partner that's not working and the other one that is, and they're on the 34 and a half cent tax bracket. And therefore, obviously the person that's not working is on the zero cent tax bracket. So say we've got this property and it makes a $5,000 loss for the year. If the property was split 50-50, the savings would be $862.50 versus if we had the property all in the name of the person that's working, the savings would be double that. So that'd be $1,725. So you can see how making that decision on how the property is owned could be important from tax point of view. Now, obviously you wanna get further legal advice potentially on this area as to how that works and how that impacts your overall situation, but it is an interesting area to consider. So typically from just a tax point of view, if you've got a negatively geared property, you obviously want that ownership to be weighted towards the person that's on the higher tax bracket because the tax benefits are gonna be greater. Now the downside to that, like I said, is that then the capital gains is then gonna to go to that person on the higher tax bracket but that 50% discount can help this situation. If you've got a positively geared property, it's normally gonna make sense to be in the person who's got the lower income on the lower tax bracket because they're gonna have income each year from the property and then hopefully capital gains as well. And again, you'd rather that capital gains be on the person on the lower tax bracket. So in summary, you really don't wanna just make decisions based on tax. I think that's really true with anything but negative gearing is definitely one where the tax implications will come into account and you need to consider that. But you really do need to consider the overall return of your property. Are you going to get the capital growth to offset some of those downsides to negative gearing? You need to look at it from a cash flow point of view. Are you going to be able to maintain that property if it is negatively geared from a cash point of view? And you just need to overall weigh up is property vesting actually right for you. Thanks for watching this far along the video. I appreciate you being here. Go check out some of the other content on my channel hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and I'll talk to you again soon.